Epilogue of the New Magdalen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The New Magdalen by Wilkie Collins. Epilogue. Containing selections from the correspondence of Miss Grace Rosebury and Mr. Horace Holmcroft, to which are added extracts from the diary of the Reverend Julian Gray. Part One From Mr. Horace Holmcroft to Miss Grace Rosebury. I hasten to thank you, dear Miss Rosebury, for your last kind letter received by yesterday's mail from Canada believe me i appreciate your generous readiness to pardon and forget what i so rudely said to you at the time when the arts of an adventuress had blinded me to the truth in the grace which has forgiven me i recognize the inbred sense of justice of a true lady birth and breeding can never fail to assert themselves i believe in them thank god more firmly than ever you ask me to keep you informed of the progress of julian gray's infatuation and the course of conduct pursued toward him by mercy merrick if you had not favoured me by explaining your object i might have felt some surprise at receiving from a lady in your position such a request as this but the motives by which you describe yourself as being actuated are beyond dispute the existence of society as you truly say is threatened by the present lamentable prevalence of liberal ideas throughout the length and breadth of the land we can only hope to protect ourselves against impostors interested in gaining a position among persons of our rank by becoming in some sort unpleasant as it may be familiar with the arts by which imposture too frequently succeeds if we wish to know what daring lengths of cunning we can go to what pitiable self-delusion credulity can consent we must watch the proceedings even while we shrink from them of a mercy merrick and a julian gray i'm taking up my narrative again where my last letter left off i must venture to set you right on one point certain expressions which have escaped your pen suggest to me that you blame julian gray as the cause of lady janet's regrettable visit to the refuge the day after mercy merrick had left their house this is not quite correct julian as you will presently see has enough to answer for without being held responsible for errors of judgment in which he has had no share lady janet as she herself told me went to the refuge of her own free will to ask mercy merrick's pardon for the language which she had just used on the previous day i passed a night of such misery as no words can describe this i assure you is what her ladyship really said to me thinking over what my vile pride and selfishness and obstinacy had made me say and do i would have gone down on my knees to beg her pardon if she would have let me my first happy moment was when i won her consent to come and visit me sometimes at mablethorpe house you will i am sure agree with me that such extravagance as this is to be pitied rather than blamed how sad to see the decay of the faculties with advancing age it is a matter of grave anxiety to consider how much longer poor lady janet can be trusted to manage her own affairs i shall take an opportunity of touching on that matter delicately when i next see her lawyer i am straying from my subject and is it not strange i am writing to you as confidentially as if we were old friends to return to julian gray innocent of instigating his aunt's first visit to the refuge he is guilty of having induced her to go there for the second time the day after i had dispatched my last letter to you lady janet's object on this occasion was neither more nor less than to plead her nephew's cause as a humble suitor for the hand of mercy merrick imagine the descent of one of the oldest families in england inviting an adventuress in a refuge to honour a clergyman of the church of england by becoming his wife in what times do we live my dear mother shed tears of shame when she heard of it how you would love and admire my mother i dined at mablethorpe house by previous appointment on the day when lady janet returned from her degrading errand well i said waiting of course until the servant was out of the room well lady janet answered julian was quite right 
quite right in what in saying that the earth holds no nobler woman than mercy merrick has she refused him again she has refused him again thank god i felt it fervently and i said it fervently lady janet lay down her knife and fork and fixed one of her fierce looks on me it may not be your fault horace she said but if your nature is incapable of comprehending what is great and generous in other natures higher than yours but the least you can do is to distrust your own capacity of appreciation for the future keep your opinions on questions which you don't understand modestly to yourself i have a tenderness for you for your father's sake I take the most favourable view of your conduct toward Mercy Merrick. I humanely consider it the conduct of a fool. Her own words, Miss Roseberry, I assure you once more, her own words. But don't trespass too far on my indulgence. Don't insinuate again that a woman who is good enough, if she died this night, to go to heaven, is not good enough to be my nephew's wife. I expressed to you my conviction a little way back that it was doubtful whether poor Lady Janet would be much longer competent to manage her own affairs perhaps you thought me hasty then what do you think now it was of course useless to reply seriously to the extraordinary reprimand that i had received i was really shocked by a decay of principle which proceeded but too plainly from decay of the mental powers i made a soothing and respectful reply and i was favoured in return with some account of what really had happened at the refuge my mother and my sisters were disgusted when I repeated the particulars to them. You will be disgusted too. The interesting penitent, expecting Lady Janet's visit, was, of course, discovered in a touching domestic position. She had a foundling baby asleep on her lap, and she was teaching the alphabet to an ugly little vagabond girl, whose acquaintance she had first met in the street. Just the sort of artful tableau vivant to impose upon an old lady, was it not? You will understand what followed when Lady Janet opened her matrimonial negotiation. Having perfected herself in her part, Mercy Merrick, to do her justice, was not the woman to play it badly. The most magnanimous sentiments flowed from her lips. She declared that her future life was devoted to acts of charity, typified, of course, by the founding infant and the ugly little girl. However she might personally suffer, whatever might be the sacrifice of her own feelings, observe how artfully this was put to insinuate that she was herself in love with him she could not accept from mr julian gray an honour of which he was unworthy her gratitude to him and her interest in him alike forbade her to compromise his brilliant future by consenting to a marriage which would degrade him in the estimation of all his friends she thanked him with tears she thanked lady janet with more tears but she dare not in the interests of his honour and his happiness accept the hand that he offered to her god bless and comfort him and god help her to bear with her hard lot the object of this contemptible comedy is plain enough to my mind she was simply holding off julian as you know is a poor man until the influence of lady janet's persuasion is backed by the opening of lady janet's purse in one word settlements but for the profanity of the woman's language and the really lamentable credulity of the poor old lady the whole thing would make it a fit subject for a burlesque but the saddest part of the story is still to come in due course of time the lady's decision was communicated to julian gray he took leave of his senses on the spot can you believe it he has resigned his curacy at a time when the church is thronged every sunday to hear him preach this madman shuts the door and walks out of the pulpit even lady janet was not far enough gone in folly to abet him in this she remonstrated like the rest of his friends perfectly useless he had but one answer to everything they could say my career is closed what stuff you will ask naturally enough what this perverse man is going to do next i don't scruple to say that he is bent on committing suicide pray do not be alarmed there is no fear of the pistol the rope or the river julian is simply courting death within the limits of the law this is strong language i know you shall hear what the facts are and judge for yourself having resigned his curacy in his next proceeding was to offer his services 
as a volunteer to a new missionary enterprise on the west coast of africa the persons at the head of the mission proved most fortunately to have a proper sense of their duty expressing their conviction of the value of julian's assistant in the most handsome terms they made it nevertheless a condition of entertaining his proposal that he should submit to an examination by a competent medical man after some hesitation he consented to this the doctor's report was conclusive in julian's present state of health the climate of west africa would in all probability kill him in three months time foiled in his first attempt he addressed himself next to a london mission here it was impossible to raise the question of climate and here i grieve to say he has succeeded he is now working in other words he is now deliberately risking his life in the mission to green anchor fields the district known by this name is situated in a remote part of london near the thames it is notoriously infested by the most desperate and degraded set of wretches in the whole metropolitan population and is so thickly inhabited that it is hardly ever completely free from epidemic disease in this horrible place and among these dangerous people julian is now employing himself from morning to night none of his old friends ever see him since he has joined the mission he has not even called on lady janet roy my pledge is redeemed the facts are before you and my wrong in taking my gloomy view of the prospect i cannot forget that this unhappy man was once my friend and i really see no hope for him in the future deliberately self-exposed to the violence of ruffians and the outbreak of disease who is to extricate him from his shocking position the one person who can do it is the person whose association with him would be his ruin mercy merrick heaven only knows what disasters it may be my painful duty to communicate to you in my next letter you are so kind as to ask me to tell you something about myself and my plans i have very little to say on either head after what i have suffered my feelings trampled on my confidence betrayed i am as yet hardly capable of deciding what i shall do returning to my old profession to the army is out of the question in these levelling days when any obscure person who can pass an examination may call himself my brother officer and may one day perhaps command me as my superior in rank if i think of any career it is the career of diplomacy birth and breeding have not quite disappeared as essential qualifications in that branch of the public service but i have decided nothing as yet my mother and sisters in the event of your returning to england desire me to say that it will afford them the greatest pleasure to make your acquaintance sympathizing with me they do not forget what you too have suffered a warm welcome awaits you when you pay your first visit at our house most truly yours horace holmcroft part two from miss grace roseberry to mr horace holmcroft dear mr holmcroft i snatch a few moments from my other avocations to thank you for your most interesting and delightful letter how well you describe how accurately you judge if literature stood a little higher as a profession i should almost advise you but no if you entered literature how could you associate with the people whom you would be likely to meet between ourselves i always thought mr julian gray an overrated man i will not say he has justified my opinion i will only say i pity him but dear mr holmcroft how can you with your sound judgment place the sad alternatives now before him on the same level to die in green anchor fields or to fall into the clutches of that vile wretch is there any comparison between the two better a thousand times die at the post of duty than marry mercy merrick as i have written the creature's name i may add so as to have all the sooner done with the subject that i shall look with anxiety for your next letter do not suppose that i feel the smallest curiosity about this degraded and designing woman my interest in her is purely religious persons of my devout turn of mind she is an awful warning when i feel satan near me it will be such a means of grace to think of mercy merrick poor lady janet i notice those signs of mental decay to which you so feelingly allude at the last interview i had with her in mablethorpe house if you can find an opportunity will you say that i wish her well here and hereafter 
and will you please add that i do not omit to remember her in my prayers there's just a chance of my visiting england towards the close of the autumn my fortunes have changed since i wrote last i have been received as a reader and companion by a lady who is the wife of one of our high judicial functionaries in this part of the world i do not take much interest in him he is what they call a self-made man his wife is charming besides being a person of highly intellectual tastes she is greatly her husband's superior as you will understand when i tell you that she is related to the gomerys of pomery not the pomerys of gomery who as your knowledge of our old families will inform you only claim kindred with the younger branch of that ancient race in the elegant and improving companionship which i now enjoy i should feel quite happy but for one drawback the climate of canada is not favourable to my kind patroness and her medical advisers recommend her to winter in london in this event i am to have the privilege of accompanying her it is necessary to add that my first visit will be paid at your house i already feel united by sympathy to your mother and your sisters there is a sort of freemasonry among gentle women is there not with best thanks and remembrances and many delightful anticipations of your next letter believe me dear mr holmcroft truly yours grace rosebury part three from mr horace holmcroft to miss grace rosebury my dear miss rosebury pray excuse my long silence i have waited for mail after mail in the hope of being able to send you some good news at last it is useless to wait it longer my worst forebodings have been realized my painful duty compels me to write a letter which will surprise and shock you let me describe events in their order as they happened in this way i may hope to gradually prepare your mind for what is to come about three weeks after i wrote to you last julian gray paid the penalty of his headlong rashness i do not mean that he suffered any actual violence at the hands of the people among whom he had cast his lot on the contrary he succeeded incredible as it may appear in producing a favourable impression on the ruffians about him as i understand it they began by respecting his courage in venturing among them alone and they ended in discovering that he was really interested in promoting their welfare it is to the other peril indicated in my last letter that he has fallen the victim the peril of disease not long after he began his labours in the district fever broke out we only heard that julian had been struck down by the epidemic when it was too late to remove him from the lodging that he occupied in the neighbourhood i made inquiries personally the moment the news reached us the doctor in attendance refused to answer for his life in this alarming state of things poor lady janet impulsive and unreasonable as usual insisted on leaving mablethorpe house and taking up her residence near her nephew finding it impossible to persuade her of the folly of removing from home and its comforts at her age i felt it my duty to accompany her we found accommodation such as it was in a riverside inn used by ship captains and commercial travellers i took it upon myself to provide the best medical assistant lady janet's insane prejudices against doctors impelling her to leave this important part of the arrangements entirely in my hands it is needless to weary you by entering into details on the subject of julian's illness the fever pursued the ordinary course and it was characterized by the usual intervals of delirium and exhaustion succeeding each other subsequent events which it is unfortunately necessary to relate to you leave me no choice but to dwell as briefly as possible on the painful subject of the delirium in other cases the wanderings of fever-stricken people present i am told a certain variety of range in julian's case they were limited to one topic he talked incessantly of mercy merrick his invariable petition to his medical attendants entreated them to send for her to nurse him day and night that one idea was in his mind and that one name on his lips the doctors naturally made inquiries as to this absent person i was obliged in confidence to state the circumstances to them plainly the eminent physician whom i had called in to superintend the treatment behaved admirably though he has risen from the lower order of the people 
he has strange to say the instincts of a gentleman he thoroughly understood our trying position and felt all the importance of preventing such a person as mercy merrick from seizing the opportunity of intruding herself at the bedside a soothing prescription i have his own authority for saying it was all that was required to meet the patient's case the local doctor on the other hand a young man and evidently a red-hot radical proved to be obstinate and considering his position insolent as well i have nothing to do with the lady's character and with your opinion of it he said to me i have only to the best of my judgment to point out to you the likeliest means of saving the patient's life our art is at the end of its resources send for mercy marrick no matter who she is or what she is there is just a chance especially if she proves to be a sensible person and a good nurse that he may astonish you all by recognising her in that case only his recovery is probable if you persist in disregarding his entreaties if you let the delirium go on for four and twenty hours more he's a dead man lady janet was most unluckily present when this impudent opinion was delivered at the bedside need i tell you the sequel called upon to choose between the course indicated to a physician who is making his five thousand a year and who is certain of the next medical baronetcy and the advice volunteered by an obscure general practitioner at the east end of london who is not making his five hundred a year need i stop to inform you of her ladyship's decision you know her and you will only too well understand that her next proceeding was to pay a third visit to the refuge two hours later i'll give you one word of honour i'm not exaggerating mercy merrick was established at julian's bedside the excuse of course was that it was her duty not to let any private scruples of her own stand in the way when a medical authority had declared that she might save the patient's life you will not be surprised to hear that i withdrew from the scene the physician followed my example after having written his soothing prescription and having been grossly insulted by the local practitioners refusing to make use of it i went back in the doctor's carriage he spoke most feelingly and properly without giving any positive opinion i could see that he had abandoned all hope of julian's recovery we are in the hands of providence mr holmcroft those were his last words as he sat me down at my mother's door i have hardly the heart to go on if i studied my own wishes i should feel inclined to stop here let me at least hasten to the end in two or three days time i received my first intelligence of the patient and his nurse lady janet informed me that he had recognized her when i heard this i felt prepared for what was to come the next report announced that he was gaining strength and the next that he was out of danger upon this lady janet returned to mablethorpe house i called there a week ago and heard that he had been removed to the seaside i called yesterday and received the latest information from her ladyship's own lips my pen almost refuses to write it mercy merrick has consented to marry him an outrage on society that is how my mother and my sisters view it that is how you will view it too my mother has herself struck julian's name off her invitation list the servants have their orders if he presumes to call not at home i am unhappily only too certain that i am correct in writing to you of this disgraceful marriage as of a settled thing lady janet went the length of showing me the letters one from julian the other from the woman herself fancy mercy merrick in correspondence with lady janet roy addressing her as my dear lady janet and signing yours affectionately i had not the patience to read either of the letters through julian's tone is the tone of a socialist in my opinion his bishop ought to be informed of it as for her she plays her part just as cleverly with her pen as she played it with her tongue i cannot disguise from myself i am wrong in yielding sad forebodings fill my mind when i think of the future i feel as if the first contemptuous look that is cast at my husband will destroy my happiness though it may not disturb him as long as i was parted from him i could control my weakness I could accept my hard lot but how can i resist him after having watched for weeks at his bedside after having seen his first smile and heard his first grateful words to me while i was slowly helping him back to life 
there is the tone which she takes through four closely written pages of nauseous humility and claptrap sentiment it is enough to make one despise women thank god there is the contrast at hand to remind me of what is due to the better few among the sex i feel that my mother and my sisters are doubly precious to me now may i add on the side of consolation that i prize with hardly inferior gratitude the privilege of corresponding with you farewell for the present i am too rudely shaken in my most cherished convictions i am too depressed and disheartened to write more all good wishes go with you dear miss rotherbury until we meet most truly yours horace holmcroft part four extracts from the diary of the reverend julian gray first extract a month today since we were married i have only one thing to say i would cheerfully go through all that i have suffered to live this one month over again i never knew what happiness was until now and better still i have persuaded mercy that it is all her doing i have scattered her misgivings to the winds she is obliged to submit to evidence and to own that she can make the happiness of my life we go back to london tomorrow she regrets leaving the tranquil retirement of this remote seaside place she dreads change i care nothing for it it is all one to me where i go so long as my wife is with me second extract the first cloud has risen i entered the room unexpectedly just now and found her in tears with considerable difficulty i persuaded her to tell me what had happened are there any limits to the mischief that could be done by the tongue of a foolish woman the landlady at my lodgings is the woman in this case having no decided plans for the future as yet we returned most unfortunately as the event has proved to the rooms in london which i inhabited in my bachelor days they are still mine for six weeks to come and mercy was unwilling to let me incur the expense of taking her to a hotel at breakfast this morning i rashly congratulated myself in my wife's hearing on finding that a much smaller collection than usual of letters and cards had accumulated in my absence breakfast over i was obliged to go out painfully sensitive poor thing to any change in my experience of the little world around me which it is possible to connect with the event of my marriage mercy questioned the landlady in my absence about the diminished number of my visitors and my correspondence the woman seized the opportunity of gossiping about me and my affairs and my wife's quick perception drew the right conclusion unerringly my marriage has decided certain wise heads of families on discontinuing their social relations with me the facts unfortunately speak for themselves people who in former years habitually called upon me and invited me or who in the event of my absence habitually wrote to me at this season have abstained with a remarkable unanimity from calling inviting or writing now it would have been a sheer waste of time to say nothing of its also implying a want of confidence in my wife if i had attempted to set things right by disputing mercy's conclusion i could only satisfy her that not so much as the shadow of disappointment or mortification rested on my mind in this way i have to some extent succeeded in accompanying my poor darling but the wound has been inflicted and the wound is felt there is no disguising that result i must face it boldly trifling as this incident is in my estimation it has decided me on one point already in shaping my future of course i am now resolved to act on my own convictions in preference to taking the well-meant advice of such friends are still left to me all my little success in life has been gained in the pulpit i am what is termed a popular preacher but i have never in my secret self felt any exultation in my own notoriety or any extraordinary respect for the means by which it has been won in the first place i have a very low idea of the importance of oratory as an intellectual accomplishment there is no other art in which the conditions of success are so easy of attainment there is no other art in the practice of which so much that is purely superficial passes itself off habitually for something that claims to be profound then again how poor is the result of which it achieves 
take my own case how often for example have i thundered with all my heart and soul against the wicked extravagance of dress amongst women against their filthy false hair and their nauseous powders and paints how often to take another example i have denounced the mercenary and material spirit of the age the habitual corruptions and dishonesties of commerce in high places and in low what good have i done i have delighted the very people whom it was my object to rebuke what a charming sermon more eloquent than ever i used to dread the sermon at the other church do you know i quite look forward to it now that is the effect i produce on sunday but on monday the women are off to the milliners to spend more money than ever the city men are off to business to make more money than ever while my grocer loud in my praises in his sunday coat turns up his weekday sleeves adulterates his favourite preacher's sugar as cheerfully as usual i have often in past years felt the objections to pursuing my career which are here indicated and they were bitterly present to my mind when i resigned my curacy and they strongly influence me now i am weary of my cheaply won success in the pulpit i am weary of society as i find it in my time i felt some respect for myself and some heart and hope in my works amongst the miserable wretches in green anchor fields but i cannot and must not return among them i have no right now to trifle with my health and my life i must go back to my preaching or i must leave england among a primitive people away from the cities in the far and fertile west of the great american continent i might live happily with my wife and do good among my neighbours secure of providing for our wants out of the modest little income which is almost useless to me here in the life which i thus picture to myself i see love peace health and duties and occupations that are worthy of a christian man what prospect is before me if i take the advice of my friends and stay here work of which i am weary because i have long ceased to respect it petty malice that strikes at me through my wife and mortifies and humiliates her turn where she may if i had only myself to think of i might defy the worst that malice can do but i have mercy to think of mercy whom i love better than my own life women live poor things in the opinions of others i have had one warning already of what my wife is likely to suffer at the hands of my friends heaven forgive me for misusing the world shall i deliberately expose her to fresh mortifications and this for the sake of returning to a career the rewards of which i no longer prize no we shall both be happy we will both be free god is merciful nature is kind love is true and in the new world as well as the old to the new world we will go third extract i hardly know whether i have done right or wrong i mentioned yesterday to lady janet the cold reception of me on my return to london and the painful sense of it felt by my wife my aunt looks at the matter from her own peculiar point of view and makes light of it accordingly you never did and you never will understand society julian said her ladyship these poor stupid people simply don't know what to do they're waiting to be told by a person of distinction whether they are or are not to recognize your marriage in plain english they are waiting to be led by me consider it done i will lead them i thought my aunt was joking the event of today has shown me that she is terribly in earnest lady janet has issued invitations for one of her general grand balls at mablethorpe house and she has caused the report to be circulated everywhere that the object of the festival is to celebrate the marriage of mr and mrs julian gray at first i refused to be present to my amazement however mercy sides with my aunt she reminds me of all that we both owe to lady janet and she has persuaded me to alter my mind we are to go to the ball at my wife's express request the meaning of this as i interpret it is that my poor love is still pursued in secret by the dread that my marriage has injured me in general estimation she will suffer anything risk anything believe anything to be freed from that one haunting doubt lady janet predicts a social triumph 
and my wife's despair not my wife's conviction accepts the prophecy as for me i am prepared for the result it will end in our going to the new world and trying society in its infancy among the forests and plains i shall quietly prepare for our departure and own what i have done at the right time that is to say when the ball is over fourth extract i have met with a man for my purpose an old college friend of mine now partner in a firm of ship owners largely concerned in emigration one of their vessels sails for america from the port of london in a fortnight touching at plymouth by a fortunate coincidence lady janet's ball takes place in a fortnight i see my way helped by the kindness of my friend i have arranged to have a cabin kept in reserve on payment of a small deposit if the ball ends as i believe it will in new mortifications for mercy do what they may i defy them to mortify me i have only to say the word by telegraph and we shall catch the ship at plymouth i know the effect it will have when i break the news to her but i am prepared with my remedy the pages of my diary written in past years will show plainly enough that it is not she who is driving me away from england she will see the longing for me for another work and other scenes expressing itself over and over again long before the time when we first met fifth extract mercy's ball dress a present from kind lady janet is finished i was allowed to see the first trial or preliminary rehearsal of this work of art i don't in the least understand the merits of silk and lace but one thing i know my wife will be the most beautiful woman at the ball the same day i called on lady janet to thank her and encountered a new revelation of the wayward and original character of my dear old aunt she was on the point of tearing up a letter when i went into her room seeing me she suspended her purpose and handed me the letter it was in mercy's handwriting lady janet pointed to a passage on the last page tell your wife with my love she said that i am the most obstinate woman of the two i positively refuse to read her as i positively refuse to listen to her whenever she attempts to return to that one subject now give me the letter back i gave it back and saw it torn up before my face the one subject prohibited to mercy as sternly as ever is still the subject of the personation of grace roseberry nothing could have been more naturally introduced or more delicately managed than my wife's brief reference to a subject no matter the reading of the first line was enough lady janet shut her eyes and destroyed the letter lady janet is determined to live and die absolutely ignorant of the true story of mercy merrick what unanswerable riddles we are is it wonderful if we perpetually fail to understand one another sixth extract the morning after the ball it is done and over society has beaten lady janet i have neither patience nor time to write at length of it we leave for plymouth by the afternoon express we were rather late in arriving at the ball the magnificent rooms were filling fast walking through them with my wife she drew my attention to a circumstance which i had not noticed at the time julian she said look round among the ladies and tell me if you see anything strange as I looked round, the band began playing a waltz. I observed that a few people only passed by us to the dancing room. I noticed next that of those few, fewer still were young. At last it burst upon me. With certain exceptions, so rare as to prove the rule, there were no young girls at Lady Janet's ball. I took Mercy at once back to the reception room. Lady Janet's face showed that she too was aware of what had happened. The guests were still arriving. We received the men and their wives, the men and their mothers, the men and their grandmothers, but in place of their unmarried daughters, elaborate excuses offered with a shameless politeness, wonderful to see. Yes, this was how the matrons in high life had got over the difficulty of meeting Mrs. Julian Gray at Lady Janet's house. Let me do strict justice to everyone. The ladies who were present 
showed the needful respect for their hostess. They did their duty. No, overdid it is perhaps the better phrase. I really had no adequate idea of the coarseness and rudeness which have filtered their way through society in these later times until I saw the reception accorded to my wife. Days of prudery and prejudice are days gone by. Excessive amiability and excessive liberality are the two favourite assumptions of the modern generation. To see the women expressing their liberal forgetfulness of my wifely misfortunes, and the men their amiable anxiety to encourage her husband, to hear the same set phrases repeated in every room, so charmed to make your acquaintance, Mrs. Gray, so much obliged, dear Lady Janet, for giving us this opportunity. Julian, old man, what a beautiful creature! I envy you, upon my honour, I envy you. To receive this sort of welcome, emphasised by obtrusive handshakings, sometimes actually by downright kissing of my wife, and then to look round and see that not one in thirty of these very people had brought their unmarried daughters to the ball, was, I honestly believe, to see civilised human nature in its basest conceivable aspect. The new world may have its disappointments in store for us, but it cannot possibly show us any spectacle so abject as the spectacle which we witnessed last night at my aunt's ball. Lady Janet marked her sense of the proceeding adopted by her guests by leaving them to themselves. Her guests remained and supped heartily, notwithstanding. They all knew by experience that there were no stale dishes and no cheap wines at Mablethorpe House. They drank to the end of the bottle and they ate to the last truffle in the dish. Mercy and I had an interview with my aunt upstairs before we left. I felt it necessary to state plainly my resolution to leave England. The scene that followed was so painful that I cannot prevail upon myself to return to it in these pages. My wife is reconciled to our departure, and Lady Janet accompanies us as far as Plymouth. These are the results. No words can express my sense of relief. Now that it is all settled, the one sorrow I shall carry away with me from the shores of England will be the sorrow of parting with dear, warm-hearted Lady Janet. At her age, it is a parting for life. So closes my connection with my own country. While I have mercy by my side, I face the unknown future, certain of carrying my happiness with me, go where I may. We shall find five hundred adventurers like ourselves when we join the emigrant ship, for whom their native land has no occupation and no home. Gentlemen of the statistical department, add two more to the number of social failures produced by England in the year of our Lord, 1871. Julian Gray and Mercy Merrick. End of epilogue. End of the New Magdalen by Wilkie Collins. Recording by Peter Keeble, Nottingham, United Kingdom.